When thinking about the consequences of peak oil, I began to wonder what might happen to us here in the Northeast if trucks and planes can't deliver vegetables from faraway places during the winter. I consulted Eric Tonesmeyer in Holyoke, Massachusetts, author of Perennial Vegetables and co-author of Edible Forest Gardens, who showed me his converted, average-sized, lifeless backyard that now grows a diversity of delicious, nutritious perennial fruits and vegetables year-round, proving it's possible to grow our own food in an urban setting with a short growing season. You've created this fantastic perennial polyculture from, from what? What was this place when you first moved here? When we moved in, the house had just been built. Mm -hmm. And um, right out to about here, it was just totally compacted fill. It was clay with chunks of concrete and essentially no vegetation at Wait, all. Wait, chunks of concrete? Chunks of concrete, We're urbanite, here. we call it, yeah. Urbanite. Yep, yeah. yeah. and there's still plenty of it underground. So when you came here and you looked at the backyard, you thought, oh, I can transform this. Oh yeah. Really? Oh yeah, absolutely. You weren't turned off by No, we were concrete? excited, that's what we wanted to do. Is the principle of site repair is, you know, don't go right. cut down an old growth forest and plant your garden there take a place that's beat up as long as it's not contaminated with stuff that's going to give you cancer or something and fix it up and you know take charge of that take charge of something that people have already messed up and that's worked really well for us I mean at this point you would not know that it was so terrible back here we used a process called sheet mulching where we brought in um, from the neighbors yard people throw out bags of leaves uh -huh. you know these giant garbage bags full of leaves we yeah. brought about a hundred of those and we just put them on the ground in layers with compost. And then we added uh, cardboard on top, like the boxes from refrigerators and stuff. Right. So that weeds would be killed. The few weeds we had could uh -huh. not germinate through that, could not poke up through that. And then we put compost on top and mulch. And that was it. Now what is an edible forest garden? Well, if you imagine, um, what we're trying to do is mimic what a forest does in terms of the structure and the patterning uh -huh. of a forest. Uh, but make it taste better than your average forest around here. So we're trying to incorporate trees and shrubs, vines and perennial plants growing together. So you have shade loving things growing under taller things that take full sun but provide mm -hmm. some shade to the mm -hmm. things below them. Um, some of them provide fertility for the other plants. Some provide pest control. Some provide weed control and other kinds of soil building services. And almost everything in it is edible. It produces some kind of food. That sounds like a well-functioning community. That is the idea, yes. You basically replicate the function of a living ecosystem in your garden with food producing plants. And in general, the perennial crops are up and really fully ready to eat when the annual crops are still only an inch high. It extends the season much earlier, much later into the fall as well. There's stuff to eat. Generally, they're kind of early and late crops. Then in the middle of the season is a good time for annuals. And then we grow some tropical leaf crops in the front yard where um, it's very, very hot, but since they're crops from tropical areas, those provide us with good greens in midsummer. So between the different microclimates and the different kind of crops we have really year round, and then winter greens in the greenhouse. So there really isn't a day that goes by that we can't eat some leaves from the garden inside the house. So you're basically getting nutrient dense food year round. That's the from idea. your urban backyard. Absolutely. So we yes. can do this. Oh, it's so easy. We don't. We're it's not so going to have to to go without greens in no. the winter in the no. northeast. No, no. If, if we have, you know, petroleum related supply issues. Yeah. So let's project into the future. It's it's late January or early February, mm. and you come in here. If it's what are you going to harvest? Vitamin greens and various other kinds of mu uh, mizuna, uh -huh. various other kinds of tender mustard family vegetables, leaf crops. Um, and then over here we'll have probably beets, carrots, um, and then a big patch of arugula, a big patch of spinach. That's crop fancy. Of cilantro too. So you don't have to starve and eat potatoes during the winter. No, you don't. No, you don't. That is inspiring. Yeah, I, that would be boring. <laughs> With heat, you can grow all kinds of stuff. And you can build greenhouses onto heated homes, mm -hmm. or even better, onto factories and things that produce a lot of heat, like power plants. 
You can build huge greenhouses off those that use the waste heat. And that's where you could start to grow in a region like this, grow your own bananas, pineapples, papayas, things like that. Back in the day, in the late 1800s, there were so many greenhouses producing vegetables outside of New York City and Boston in the winter that they would ship vegetables by rail to Florida in the winter because there wasn't any agriculture in Florida. That yet. So you know nuts. we can do it. You know right. we can do it. It was done, you know, a hundred years ago. There's no reason it couldn't be done again. Oh my God. These are, these are kind of expensive in the store, yes? Expensive in the store and, and they not come with that, that weird good. styrofoam They come with over. the styrofoam around <laughs> them, yeah. You can grow them at home. They're really easy. Um, they're much, much easier than apples to grow. Rushy. And they're super good. But you get greens the first year and you get roots the first year and all that, so there's plenty of So you good. had your annuals going. Oh yeah, and the perennial the crops were doing good yields the first year too. A lot of them will do that. So, so you were eating within months. Oh yeah. From here. Oh yeah. What's the maintenance on this like? I mean, this is all like fun and wonderful and you're eating all year round and your neighbors like it and your friends like it and you feel really good and it's empowering and you're, you know, saving money and you're not using lots of fossil fuels, but tell me about the maintenance. How much work? Well, it was a lot of work to set up. Okay. Building the beds in the first place, um, bring, building soil where there was no soil, that was a lot of work. At this point, uh, our estimate is it's about maybe um, two hours a week in terms of caring for the plants. Two hours a week? That's yeah. nothing, Well, actually. maybe an hour a week of care and then an hour of harvest. And there are certainly lots of low-maintenance perennial vegetables that make a lot of food that take almost no work at all. It's not, uh, it's not really a high-maintenance system at all compared to, and I've done lots of annual vegetable farming, I know that's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. You want redundancy in your food crop so that if, for whatever reason, this or that happens, you still get, or a particular disease or pest comes in, you still have your food production. Right. No what. It's a wonderful um, shoot crop. Basically, it's a native asparagus. We grow cattails and water celery and watercress and arrowhead and water mimosa. Fuki is a perennial vegetable. The part you eat is this leaf stalk right here. The pawpaw is a, a hardy relative of tropical fruit. Right here in Holyoke. Yep. Asian pears. Mm -hmm. These are golden raspberries. Running Juneberry. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice fruit. It's sort of like an almond flavored blueberry, and it makes fruit a good... That sounds like a Franken food. Yeah. <laughs> Grows quite a bit earlier than uh, But no, than Nabisco didn't have anything Nabisco to do with it. Nabisco has nothing to do with it. We've grown wild rice. This is the American persimmon. Where does sea kale come from? Coastal Europe. This is a dwarf, dwarf kind of Jerusalem artichoke. This is beach plum, which is a fantastic native fruit crop. Our bean is groundnut, which is a wonderful native root crop. That's a a native potato crop. that grows on a bean. Down here we have anise hyssop, did, which is did a... Did Dr. Seuss come in and plant, so. plant something in your garden? A lot of our stuff is from Dr. <laughs> Seuss. It's anise hyssop, which is a wonderful tea plant. These are uh, cold hardy bamboos. Uh, perennial broccoli rob. And these are Egyptian onions. Tropical, tropical this area your front up front. front yard? This is not even a yard. This is not a yard. This is your front driveway. Six. Yam and passion fruit and we banana have. in your urban asphalt driveway. Oh yeah. Cucumber berries. We've grown huge sweet potatoes up here. Um, we have a lot of fun. <laughs> lab lab beans we've grown all the way to the top of the telephone pole so the power company had to cut them down because it was going to shut down the neighborhood. <laughs> Um, we have a good time up here. It's fun. <laughs> Trying to take advantage of the situation we have of a hot asphalt garden. Hot asphalt garden. Perennial polyculture, power plant produce, and uh, asphalt garden. There you go. That sums up what we do pretty well. That's all you need for urban life. <laughs> Great. Oh, those are perfect for the Keebler elves. Totally. You could trade them those cucumbers for cookies. You know, I think I need to get more of a regional economy going with my local <laughs> Keebler elves. I think that'd be a very good idea. <laughs>